Hey, welcome back to Steve and Dave's 50 Years Ago This Month. This month we're going to be looking at uh, February 1970, specifically uh, the chart from February 14th, 1970. February 14th. Steve, what, what, what's yeah. significant about that, Dave? Yeah, February 14th, obviously Valentine's Day. Um, certainly my least favorite oh, holiday, yeah. uh, certainly as a kid, for sure. Really? I deeply resented that. Oh, because all, all the girls were bothering you? Oh, that wasn't really it. I, what I did, now, what I really didn't like was the, uh, was taking the, the Valentines. I mean, you know, you made these little Valentines boxes in the classroom and whatnot, and you had to give everybody a Valentine. I just really despised that. I mean, I just really despised it. And I typically would, I tossed the Valentines uh, before I got home. My mom would ask me, where are the Valentines? And I would come up with some excuse like, well, I don't know. I guess we didn't do it this year or something like that. Just didn't really like it. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I, well, it, yeah, you know, and I remember that too. And I remember it being a duty that you had to do, and everybody's supposed to get one. And there was always yeah. a kid in the class that was unpopular and something like that. Well, and you couldn't give that. them a, a legitimate one, so you were essentially forced to mob. It was uh, Valentine's Day became an occasion. For, uh, it was yeah, it was awful. I agree. Yeah, it was awful. I, I, yeah. On your significant other, also not good. It's a lose lose. Yeah, and it, everything about Valentine's Day was just uh, dreadful. So, but the chart, so um, uh, at the top of the chart in mid February 1970 is Sly and the Family Stone, and the double sided hit, uh, Thank You for Let Me Be Myself Again. Um, not exactly articulated like that. And also, then uh, Everybody is a Star. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, Sly Stone is that uh, he was one of the great, one of the great stars of Woodstock, right? We are five, six months removed from, from Woodstock and everybody would, uh, everybody would say that, that their set at Woodstock was just, it was sublime. It was just electric. And when we think about- well, They, they the, came out like in the middle of the night, right? Like two middle of the night. About three o'clock in the morning. And I was exactly and 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 they had just such an energy that they they got people up and and, and going with them at this, at is this time. yeah it's exactly true and and when we think and when we think about Woodstock we think about it as being this kind of great introduction so we are introduced to Crosby Stills and Nash Young we are introduced to Melanie we're introduced to Santana right and I think for many people it was a kind of introduction to Sly and the Family Stone I mean they had yeah. hits but here they are. But what it was really was a goodbye, um, because this was uh, August of, of 1969 was um, Sly Stone at his, at his peak. In 1970, while there still were charting, obviously at the top of the charts this week, was, the, uh, was a terrible decline. I mean, this is the, the year that, that Sly Stone became, uh, well, became addicted to a variety of substances, began to miss shows, and the, the group began to kind of splinter. Um, they did do a little more chart activity in the uh, in 71. But this is kind of, this is kind of the goodbye of, of Sly and the Family Stone. And again, what makes this group so interesting is that they embodied so many of the ideals, right, of the 60s, that they were, um, that they were a family unit. His sister, brother joined them. Uh, they were um, multiracial. Uh, they were, uh, they had uh, both genders and, and everybody was, everybody in that group contributed, active, uh, vocals, the whole deal. It would just really seem almost, you almost never saw women playing instruments in rock bands, in pop bands. Well, I said, that, that's right. And they did it in the uh, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. So it was, it was very integrated, um, a, a very... A very positive vibe, a very uh, communal oh. type of thing. Absolutely. It, so this would be the last, uh, the next to last uh, top 10 uh, single. Uh, they would uh, hit the charts at number 10 with Family Affair in, in 71. But this was the end, the beginning of the end for Sly and the Family Stone. Um, in, in, thank you for letting me be myself again with the, again, the unusual spelling. Um, it really features, among others, uh, Larry Graham um, on, on the bass. And just a quick word about Graham, who in many ways sort of transformed the instrument. Um, 
it's Graham who is largely credited with the slap technique. Um, and you can hear it, um, you, it just, it's overwhelming in the song. It's really quite amazing. And he was deeply influential in terms of basis for this period. And so it, the slap technique is, you just can't get away from it. But um, there, is a, there is sadness when you think about flying the family stone in an interesting sort of way, because so much of their music was joyous. The, 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 again, their appearance at Woodstock was so joyous, but there's just an overwhelming kind of sadness when you think about the group. Um, and they've largely, again, disappeared from the from public conversation. So um, at number one, again, that week was uh, Sly and the Family Stone. Um, and number two uh, was the Jackson Five, uh, I Want You Back. Uh, this um, family uh, from, from Gary, Indiana, of, of humble means. Um, and they were in the midst of their real power run um, in the early 1970s with uh, four consecutive, at least four consecutive number ones and I Want You Back was uh, number two this week. Um, yeah, they were very, very powerful. It was really, um, and we, we've had an opportunity to talk about them a, a little bit already, but um, yes, uh, and, and it's clear they, they had uh, an immense appeal. At, absolutely. Uh, at number three, uh, B.J. Thomas's um, the theme from uh, <clears throat> Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, um, which is, you know, a, a song that we, we've talked about before. Um, but maybe we should just talk briefly about the, the movie that it comes from, because um, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid was the first, um, the, uh, the first film that paired uh, Newman, Paul Newman and, and Robert Redford. And would be really. It was the uh, the number number one at the box office um, in 1969, I think, and um, it more than double outperformed the second slot uh, at the box office. And that's incredible. No, absolutely. Um, I don't know what it was. Was it Love Bug or something like? That? Yeah, but something anyway. like that. Yeah, yeah. But but it was a, a monstrous hit. But it fits into an interesting um, kind of subgenre that is happening in the late 1960s, where you have uh, you have buddy films, right? You know, partner films, but they are they're almost to a degree kind of countercultural, right? They're 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 antiheroes. Um, oh, very definitely, yeah. The, uh, the 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 buddies are uh, they're on this side of the law, on, on, on the other side of the law, rather. They're um, uh, at the very least, countercultural. I mean, we have Easy Rider, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, as, as a romance, we had uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And it didn't end well for any of them. No, it did. So, right. Um, but it was, they were all very popular movies at the time. Yeah, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting time um, for, for movies in the United States. And these were... Um, these were global hits. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, one of America's chief exports, along with music, has been film, and Butch Cassidy was enormously popular. So raindrops keep falling in my head at number three. Uh, at number four, uh, the <clears throat> Dutch group, Shocking Blue, uh, their massive hit, Venus, right? The celebration of all that is powerful with, with women. Uh, would be their only real hit. They're a kind of classic one-hit wonder, but uh, number four is Venus. And number five is a uh, is a beautiful song. Um, it's Eddie, Hol uh, Eddie Holman's Hey There, Lonely Girl. And you can hear it in the playlist. It may not immediately come to mind as we mention it here, but if you listen to it in the playlist, his voice, Holman's voice is just, you know, it's just extraordinary. There is, there are a few voices, I think, that hit that kind of falsetto that he nails in this song that, I mean, it's just staggering. It, it, his ability to, to reach these notes. He had a, um, an incredibly uh, versatile uh, range. So he only hits the, the chart once with Hey There, Lonely Girl, which is a, a remake of Ruby and the Romantics' Hey There, Lone, uh, Holy Boy uh, from the early 1960s. But I mention Holman because he's a, a figure that um, has remained active uh, in, in uh, education. He works with uh, students in Philadelphia. Um, he also went into the ministry. Um, I, I don't have much more to say about Holman, except that that song, if I guess if you're going to have one song 
uh, have a song like this. It's just, it's just extraordinary. And it is interesting to think about somebody with this obvious, these obvious gifts. I mean, you don't have to be a trained in, in, in vocal study to hear his voice and think, my God, that's just that. The, the range there is just, it, it just seems limitless and effortless at the same time. And how he only found his way to the charts with one song is must be an interesting story, but you know such as this such as life I guess. But uh, again, I encourage you to take a listen to that. But uh, at number at number five is is Holman's Hay there, a lonely girl. At number six, the Canadian group, uh, but guess who uh, charts again um, this time with no time. Yeah, right. Um, formed in Winnipeg, nineteen sixty two. Um, they're at the height uh, of their popularity here. We're going to talk about uh, the guests who uh, a number of times as we move through the uh, through the year. In 1970, for a while, they are the best-selling rock group in the world. Yeah. So um, clearly, they're doing something right at this point. Interestingly enough, it was released. Um, no time was released in, in uh, November 1969, and half a half a year later. Uh, Randy Bachman would would leave the group. So that's, that's I, right. and I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that he had been with the group for for such a short time um, before leaving. And and some of my favorite hits uh, from the guests were were without Bachman. Um, but this Mine too. this one yeah. was. I think I think the last uh, they may have had one or more uh, one or two more chart that Bachman played on. But uh, the point is. They're they're reaching an end uh, of the of the Bachman uh, guess who. No, that's right. You said about this. Go ahead. Yeah. No, go. No, no. I just no. It's the classic lineup. No, it's the classic lineup of the guess who. But it lasts so such a short amount of time that it's just it's quite extraordinary to think about how much that group accomplished in just really kind of a couple of years. Yeah, but you were saying about the Bachman's thoughts about this. Okay, yeah. Uh, obviously, the song was written by, by Bachman and, and the uh, vocalist Burton Cummings. And, uh, and he said, me and Burton were trying to be like uh, Neil and Stephen Stills. Um, this was their attempt to, to get that yeah. uh, Buffalo Springfield sound. Um, so, yeah, it is interesting because I don't, I don't necessarily see it. I like the song. Um, no, I like but it's also interesting if you're if you're a Canadian, you just call him Neil. He's Neil. They, um, yeah, that's okay. the thing, right? He's Neil, of course. Yeah, it's Canada. It's a small country. It's a big country and a small sure. country at the same time, right? Well, and I think really in the music scene, it really was a small, was oh, a small I scene. Think Everybody was. was I think it was, and um, Neil Young was also from um, from Winnipeg. And, Winnipeg, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think when the the scene in Canada was happening in the kind of early 60s, there were really just a kind of, there was a handful of stops that, that bands would make, and they had a tremendous amount of overlap. And so they spent, all these guys, you know, interacted a great deal as they were, you know, young men. And then many of them, again, regrouped in California when they went out and, and, and tried to hit the big time in the music industry. But but guess who? It's easy to sort of overlook them, and I and I and I wonder if that's in part because they are from Canada. I mean, I think many things Canadian get get overlooked in the United States. But what you said just a second ago about their the, about their power to to sell records and that, that they were for a time right the a kind of global power when it comes to to, to selling music. Right. It's just extraordinary if you think about it. And uh, again. And that classic lineup only lasts uh, just a very, very short amount of time. Although, interestingly, they're playing together again. They're, they're together, they're Bachman and Cummings tour and, and do some okay. show. Oh, that's interesting. You know, this was, uh, there were actually two versions of this song. Um, hmm. And the, the one we're looking at now um, peaked at number five, but it was, uh, it was on the, uh, released on the American Woman album. Oh, yeah. Um, Produced by Jack Richardson, who, by the way, is also uh, kind of an interesting character. Yeah, uh, not only did he uh, produce uh, most of the stuff that Guess Who was doing, um, 
but he also was producing for people like Alice Cooper, Bob Seger, Badfinger, Hoko, Ooh. and the Irishers. Ooh. So, um, you know, at this anyway, this particular single was the third in a, in a string of million selling singles um, that all hit number one in Canada. So yeah, they, they were a powerhouse at that point. Um, yeah, so much for that. Yeah, so, but, well, so the, guess, the guess who, and as you said a second ago, we'll, we'll come across the guess who in later editions of our, of our, our, our chart conversation. At, uh, at number seven is Dionne Warwick's um, I'll Never Fall in Love Again, the uh, Backrack David uh, classic, I think. I think it's fair to say a classic that, um, that peaked at number six. Uh, you know, Dionne Warwick is an amazingly, uh, it's an amazing performer. Um, one of the highest selling female vocalists of, of all time. It's, it's astounding the, the number of records that, that, she, that she sold. She hit the charts, the top 10, uh, 12 times uh, in her career. Just really quite an amazing and, and prolific artist spanning multiple uh, decades, of course. And, and well, they, I, I have her greatest hits. Oh, do, is that right? No, oh, it's, yeah. it's fantastic, right? Yeah, it's, it's really good. You know, it's, uh, her, she had a tremendous crossover appeal, um, which is, I think, part of the, the, it's always the secret sauce when it comes to selling a lot of records, particularly in this era. And so she, she appealed to a, a broad array of audiences. And she hit a particular kind of gold when she would, uh, interpret that the David and Backrack numbers, you know, how David and Burke Backrack you know, were a partner uh, for really only for about 20 years from the, uh, from the mid to late 50s to the, the mid 70s. But in that time, they, you know, they mined gold for, I mean, it's just extraordinary, the, their output. Now, this particular song uh, comes from a, a musical, uh, Promises, Promises. And the, the musical Promises, Promises is the... Um, Kind of the music theater interpretation of the uh, of the classic film *The Apartment*, and behind the musical was not was not only then Backrack and David, but this this guy named Neil Simon. Um, and *Promises Promises* was quite successful on, on Broadway, had uh, well over a thousand shows in its initial run, uh, nominated for a Tony and all that. And it's. I guess what I want to get to here is that there are songwriting duos that make an enormous difference, right, in, in the cultural life of the country. And sometimes uh, these songwriting duos are well known and sometimes they're not. I would say that in terms of Backrack and David, these are probably, well, probably as well known as, as any songwriting duo in modern American history. I'd have to maybe think about that for a second. Second, but I mean, right? You'd agree with that—that that Backrack and David. When pe people hear that, and it's sort of—if you're talking about American uh, American songwriting team, I think Lennon and McCartney come to mind. In terms sure. Of out there, you go. Absolutely. Out, um, well, that—that that, I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah, of course, I wouldn't disagree with that. But in a more, I don't know, traditional or kind of classical vein. Classical is not the right word, but almost Tin Pan Alley. Uh, Backrack and David, you know. They really have no peer in that in that regard, and so Dionne Warwick in um, in the late '60s and early 1970s was just um, was just one hit after the next. And so at number seven is "I'll Never Fall in Love Again." Uh, at number eight is a, a very powerful uh, and exciting group, um, a group that had uh, really commanded the attention of of most of America in the late '60s and early 1970s. It's it's the Temptations. And their uh, their hit psychedelic shack. Well, um, the Temptations uh, were going in uh, a slightly different direction um, than most of the label, most of Motown at that point, uh, and that was largely due to their producer um, Norman Whitfield, yeah, who essentially invented psychedelic soul, and um, psychedelic shack was. Uh, written and produced by Whitfield. And this led to real tension between uh, him and the Temptations because um, he pretty much wanted to exercise complete artistic control uh, over okay. the music that they were doing at this time. 
time um, to the point that uh, they were reduced to being allowed to arrange some of the harmony. Oh boy. And that was, and so he was putting the, the instrumentation and all that stuff um, into the forefront. That was his emphasis. And they're a vocal crew. Oh yeah. You know, they weren't, they weren't real happy about that. And that, that led to, to a break, but, but Norman Whitfield is a, is a fascinating guy. He, uh, he wrote or co-wrote 92 hits on the U.S. Uh, Just the including things like Ain't Too Proud to Beg, Heard It Through the Grapevine, War. This is another thing. He wrote War and produced it with The Temptations. And, uh, and with Edwin Starr. Well, yeah. But, um, he wrote and produced Smiling Faces sometimes. Oh. With The Temptations. Yes. And also with The Undisputed Truth. All right, there we go. Who had the hit. They had the hit, yeah. Yeah. Great um, He also produced Papa Was a Rolling Stone with The Undisputed Truth. And The Temptations had the hit with that. So, so it went both ways. Yeah, it went both but, ways. But it's that's everywhere. incredible. He, Ball of Confusion, Just My Imagination, uh, Car Wash, a little later. No, oh, Rose Royce, yeah. Well, oh, just amazing. Uh, Whoa. Involved with. Uh, so he was a very important producer uh, for Motown at that time. Um, but The Temptations were not necessarily happy with, uh, with the way this was going. But yeah, this was a song that was driven by uh, multi-lead vocals, hard rock guitar, synthesizers, yeah. multi-track drums, and stereo shifting vocals. Yeah. So they were, they produced, uh, Whitfield produced the, the hell out of it. It's incredible. You know, the Temptations, you know, they always had, um, for many people in this era, you had, you know, it was the Temptations Four Tops, Temptations Four Tops. Um, for, for a lot of people though, the Temptations were the group. They always had a, um, they always had an edge. And, and part of it is the, is the production. Um, and part of it is just the, the, the power of the, of the group. Um, Eddie Kendricks and others. They just, there is something about the Temptations that just kind of went out and, and grabbed you. And they were really, I mean, they were really dynamic. And the psychedelic soul, uh, genre is a you know it was it was real wasn't it i mean there, there were songs i mean i can think of you know some fifth dimension and other groups like this that that you know were going to go in that direction it didn't last very long but man super interesting this super interesting period well All right. for me uh, ball, of, ball of confusion is my my favorite from oh, that yeah. from that genre i just think that kicks butt it's unbelievable. Yeah. Also, it, Temptations. Also, yeah. Temptations are amazing. So, uh, at um, at number eight, then you have the, the the Temptations with Psychedelic Shack. At at number nine, a familiar name in the charts, um, the Creedence Clearwater Revival (CCR), uh, who are seemingly in the charts every week for a decade. It's just quite extraordinary. Yeah. And uh, at number nine, they have the double sided hit uh, "Traveling Band" and, and "Who'll Stop the Rain." It's, um, again, CCR, in many ways, perfected the, the, the power pop single. Uh, three minutes of just, you know, intensity. And, and certainly that, that captures traveling band, you know, 737 coming out of the sky. You know, it's, the, it's, it's a rollicking number. It is a, a classic kind of garage bandish kind of thing. It's, it's been endlessly covered by groups, um, even groups just starting out, you know, Traveling Band is, you know, it's a, it's a rock song. It's a song about, you know, the road. And, and in that way, I think they've just, just, it's just perfection in a way. What's and interesting know, about the, this is that and, and, and just not be in a good mood by the, by the time it's over. I, I agree. I, yeah, there's just something yeah, and, just and, joyous and about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just want to get out and get, get going someplace. You hear that. And yeah. it's just incredible. But you flip, the, you flip that single over, and then you have um, a very different kind of song, you know, Who Will Stop the Rain, which is um, acoustic, uh, it's, it's folkish. It is, um, 
it has, it's deeper. Uh, it's an allusion to, well, a number of things, but clearly to um, people make the connection to between that song and Vietnam, a kind of, um, a kind of homage to, to the war. And, um, you know, when you look at the CCR, they're a band that's very closely associated with the anti-war movement. Uh, songs CCR like- CCR might be the definitive anti-war uh, band. I think, that's, I think that that's right. And what's so fascinating about that is that there were few bands that had more disdain for the counterculture and more disdain for hippies than CCR, particularly John Fogarty, um, who just didn't want any part of that. And so it's just, it's an interesting kind of dance that they, that they, that they play in this, in this era, that right, they are in many ways sort of the, the group associated with the anti-war movement. I want to just mention one other thing about CCR here real quickly is that their records came out on the fantasy label and, and ordinarily, you know, labels, who cares? But there's something interesting about fantasy in that fantasy was, which was out of uh, Northern California was a jazz label. Um, it, it, you name it. I mean, a number of huge jazz uh, stars were on that label. Uh, most notably a guy by the name of Vince Garaldi, who um, may not mean anything, but if you've heard the Peanuts, Linus and Lucy, you know, Garaldi was uh, on the fantasy label. Well, anyway, CCR was the, the really the sole rock act uh, on, on fantasy. And um, they made fantasy a whole lot of money. In fact, millions and millions and millions and millions. But CCR, namely John Fogarty, got into a huge dispute with the, uh, the label's head, uh, Saul Zantz. And um, basically... Well, he spent like two decades in court, right? Just... Two, yeah, it's just, yeah, it, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Just back and forth and forth and back. In fact, uh, famously, Saul Zantz um, sued... John Fogarty of plagiarizing John Fogarty um, on his album Center Field. Center Field, yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, one of the things that makes CCR um, so interesting is that they were such a, a disharmonious group. They um, they just really didn't get along, and I think that name mostly falls at the feet of John Fogarty. But despite all that, despite all the the tumult, and these guys were, yeah, boy, they didn't, yeah, they were at each other's threats the whole all the time. They produced incredible music, and they were on the top top of the charts um, all the time. And uh, so you have to wonder why people, why brothers, who apparently can't stand each other, get together to make music. You have the Everything uh, Brothers. Uh, you have Oasis. You have, you have the Black Crows, the Robinson Brothers. They're all over, and, and you just wonder if if they don't like each other, why do they say, "Hey, let's." Put a band together. Why would well, you just? Do... Yeah, I, it's an, ex, an interesting question. I, you know, on cynical, on, on a cynical level, it's like, well, this is how you make money. But maybe they they somehow connect in a way that's I don't know by mu making music they have some sort of some sort of interaction. You know, it is a fascinating trend. You just see it play out over and over throughout the decades. Yeah, you know, and boy, the Fogartys. I guess they made up. I guess they made a kind of piece right at the end of Tom Fogarty's life. But these guys, they just could not stand each other. They stayed. They stayed in, you know, in the band together for such a long time. So at number nine, you have uh, the CCR. At number ten, um, you have Mark Lindsay's Arizona. Oh, fantastic song. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. Well. It's talking about um, about a hippie girl, and and hippie girls are wonderful to talk about. And and, and uh, at this point, Mark Lindsay was still the uh, lead singer for Paul Revere and the Raiders. Right. This was a, a solo a effort of his. Um, for musicians, he got uh, the Wrecking Crew um, did the the session work on this, uh, like so much uh, other oh, stuff. Oh, they were. Oh, they were, yeah, they were everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it was written by, uh, by Kenny Young. And uh, this is another Brill building guy. Uh, yeah. But um, his uh, other big claim to fame was that he, uh, he wrote Under the Boardwalk with uh, Artie Resnick. Well, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a classic. That's a, you know, that's a top 100 pop song maybe top 50 pop song of all time. That's oh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic song, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so there's that. I think it holds up really well. 
Um, I, I still enjoy listening to it. So uh, it peaked at number 10. So this was, this was as high as it got. Yeah. Uh, went gold in April. Um, and that's basically all that needs to be said about. Well, there you go. I mean, I, you know, I, I definitely, re you know, the, Paul Revere and the Raiders, um, they certainly had their share of hits. And uh, they were a band that they came out of California. They were they dressed in distinctive or faux Revolutionary War clothing, um, but Lindsey was clearly the the breakout star. And so Arizona in uh, well, he was a pretty boy. He was. He, he was my candy. Yeah, matinee idol for sure. And um, you know, he and he used that to his advantage. And obviously, the solo career you know bore some fruit. So at number ten is is Arizona now. There, there, there are a number of other songs um, in the that are popular in mid-February that we wanted to to mention, and a couple of them. Uh, let me just talk briefly about at number thirty is a, uh, a remake or a reinterpretation of a uh, Lennon and McCartney tune, and that is primarily the McCartney tune. And it's "She Came In Through the Bathroom Window" by Joe Cocker. Cocker is. Cocker's a force of nature. I, there's something about Cocker's um, delivery that is just, it's just staggering. And he really made songs his own. Now, this particular song became a kind of, um, a kind of anthem uh, for Cocker and really was very much associated with him for the rest of his career. It didn't sell that well in the United States. It, it only reached, I think it peaked. Yeah, this is the peak. It peaked at 30. Wait a second. You Are So Beautiful is the B side of that? Oh, I think this is a different, right? pre this is a different pressing. Okay, because. Yeah, yeah, because that comes a little later. That comes, I think, You Are So okay. Beautiful comes in 74, 73, 74. I just, yeah, that, that, that just can't be. So, okay, no, that yeah, makes more but, sense. But the, but Cocker in the uh, early 1970s is, I think, at his, at his prime. And he's touring with this group, um, this hodgepodge of, of great play or great musicians and sort of hangers on and it's uh, titled Mad Dogs and Englishmen. I think I've mentioned this before, but it comes from the Noel Coward line and they label themselves this Mad Dogs and Englishmen, this is kind of this, you know, this, move, this group that would kind of roll across the, the world, led um, by Leon Russell. I want to just, uh, Suggest a couple of things. Cat dogs and Englishmen don't have the sense to come out of from the rain or something like that. That's something like that. That's exactly like yeah. 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 The uh, from this era, uh, you have the Joe Cocker with the exclamation point LP from '69, which is where this uh, since she came in from the bathroom window is, is taken from. They also recorded a, a, a live LP, Mad Dogs and Englishmen. The, the DVD came out a few years ago. I can't recommend it enough. So to watch Joe Cocker on stage is to be is to be kind of memorized. He's just you know he's a very distinctive performer, and we've talked about this before a little bit. But he is just his voice is just extraordinary, and he just makes this song his own. There is um, obviously the song comes from the Al Abbey Road LP, and it's part of the, uh, the, the that that sequence on Abbey Road, and it goes on Abbey Road. It goes by you know pretty quickly, and it's not all that notable, but boy, he really, he really nails it with this song. And so for me, it's one of the great Joe Cocker songs. And at number 30, we wanted to make mention of that. She came into the bathroom window. Also on the charts is a, um, is a tune from uh, a group called the original cast. And it's One Tin Soldier. Yeah, One Tin Soldier, it's interesting that, um that one, uh, the original cast is, is the, the group that we're talking about here, because I, I would bet that it's also not the version of the song that you grew up with, that the, the song that's that you think of when, when you think of one soldier. That's right. But interestingly enough, um, it charted each year, um, from 1969 to 1974 on yeah. in the U.S. and Canada uh, with different groups and different covers. And, but it never charted outside of, the North, outside of North America. Is that right? 
Um, the original cast was a Canadian group that uh, started, formed in 1966 as the country uh, singers. Yeah, here we are. The original cast. Um, so um, the, the lead singer uh, that, that sang um, One Teen Soldier, she came to the group um, a couple of years later. They renamed it um, the original cast, 1968. It felt like uh, the, the North Country Singers was too folksy. Mm, I could, like, yeah. yeah, kind of. Yeah, I could, yeah, yeah. So, so they didn't want like that. Anyway, so uh, this was uh, written by Dennis Lambert and uh, Brian Potter. Um, and uh, they wrote and produced for a number of acts like Seals and Croft, Grassroots, Four Tops, Dusty Springfield, Richard, Richard Harris. Uh -huh. um, before they formed their own label, Haven Records, and had artists like the Righteous Brothers and, uh, and Player. Baby Come Back was- Baby uh, Come Back, yes, yes. This they time. Uh, wrote and produced. They also produced an album for Glenn Campbell uh, on, on Capitol at the time that they were, uh, had their own label. And that included their, their song, uh, Rhinestone Cowboy. Oh, um, that's a, yeah. Wow. So, you know, that, uh, wow. they have a little string of hits of their own. For sure. Of course, the version that we're familiar with is the, uh, the version of the song came from uh, the film Billy Jack, uh, which was written and acted and produced and distributed by uh, Tom Laughlin. Yeah. He, like a one man powerhouse. Uh, and he was singularly responsible, solely responsible for, um, for making the film and, and making it a hit. It, it became uh, quite a hit. Um, it it's a strange little film. Uh, it is a strange film, but it's very much of its time and it was extraordinarily popular and, and it spawned a couple of sequels, right? But... Well, it was actually the second in a row of four, uh, four films. The first one was The Born Losers. Oh, also with, yeah. Also with Billy Jack as, a, as one of the main characters. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Half-breed um, Navajo. Uh, Indian, also a green beret. Yes, that's and right. Has yeah. some, some funky martial arts. I don't know the name of the discipline. It's not one of the well-known ones. Um, but uh, the idea was he was a pacifist who had to occasionally kick butt. Exactly, yeah. He reached a boiling point. But yeah, um, he did everything he could. Yeah, and, yeah but yeah, when, he, when it was time, it was Abhorred time. violence, but sometimes just... There's a point at which you cannot. It's kind of like the Hulk, you know. You kind of don't. Uh, you don't want to get me mad. Won't like me if you see me mad. That's right. There was something also really important about his um, his indigenous status, the, the, him being native, and that this was also a time um, in the United States where uh, Native American activism was was uh, starting to peak. Uh, protests at uh, Alcatraz in the late 1960s, and then the uh, the long siege at Wounded Knee in South Dakota in the early 1970s. And Native American rights and activism was very much as part of the cultural conversation. And so in a, in a way, Billy Jack sort of entered into that because of- uh, was, uh, was Dave Brown already uh, on the scene? On the yeah, you know that, you're right. Yeah, Barry my heart at Wounded Knee. Barry my heart at Wounded Knee, yeah. Oh, that's a, yeah, published right in this era as well. Yeah, so, really groundbreaking, groundbreaking history for sure. So that's one of the things that kind of set up the, the success uh, of the movie as well. Uh, anyway, this, uh, the version that we're talking about here was, was um, covered by Jing Dawson of uh, the group Coven. Um, yes, and Coven is the group I know, right. Coven uh, also charted with uh, One Tin Soldier in, um, in 71. They were, uh, they actually got a little bit higher with it, in fact. Number I, that's, and I, yeah. And that's, and that's why we know it, right? Yeah, um, I think that's right. They reached number 26 on uh, the Billboard Hot 100 uh, in the fall of 71. So um, the cover recording was named uh, number one all-time requested song in 1971 and 73 by the American Radio Broadcast Association. Yeah. ARBA. It's, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's a song that, um, and as uh, even as little kids, I remember um, singing that song. It's yes. a song that people would sing at camp. 
and it would be performed at like school functions. Uh, there was a kind of universality to it that uh, and kind of anti-war, anti-violence message and all this that I think really resonated with the, with Americans in particular during this time. And I think there's a reason why, as you mentioned a second ago, right? It's, you know, it keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. It's a, it's a song that the people wanted to hear. Oh, yes. And an interesting little story behind it and um, um, a, a bit preachy, perhaps, but... Uh, oh, sure. Oh, yeah. As a, as a kid, I just ate it up. I just thought it was fantastic. So. Well, I can... Yeah, me too. And I remember... I can remember singing it at camp, you know, you know, around campfires and stuff like that. It's just... Um, there is something about that song that, um, that touched a lot of hearts. And I, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's largely disappeared. It, it's one of those songs that, uh, that didn't, you know, continue to resonate through the, through the ages. But I think when, when you hear it, I think it's universality and, and why it was popular, I think, comes to mind. I mean, it's a little preachy, it's a little saccharine, but there is something about it that is, uh, and it, it, it pulls at the heartstrings for sure. Yeah. So uh, another couple songs we want to get to. Um, at 45, uh, just, just bubbling um, near the top 40 is a remake of the Tim Harden uh, classic, If I Were a Carpenter. Uh, this version is that I want to talk about just briefly is uh, from uh, June Carter Cash and, and Johnny Cash. Uh, this week, mid-February, it's uh, at 45. It will only peak at 36 on the pop charts, but will become a number two hit under country charts. Obviously, Johnny Cash is country royalty, but, but so does June Carter Cash. Uh, June Carter um, was from the Carter family of Southwest Virginia. Her mother was Mother Maybell Carter. The Carter family was considered the first family of country music. They Johnny, Carter, uh, Johnny Cash, Grew up listening to the Carter family on the radio. That's exactly right. No, that's exactly right. And so uh, that's, that's really an odd thing if you think about how this all then played out, you know, 30, 40 years later. But they were um, a very dynamic couple and a very powerful couple. And June Carter would perform alongside Johnny and for, for decades. Uh, June Carter was just, you know, she was a, a really an important performer in her own right. They really make this song their own in the way that they go back and forth. There is something about this song when you have uh, male and female voices that is um, that makes it particularly special. And their back and forth here is just it's just extraordinary. It's just well, it's, a, it's a fantastic song. It's it's a it's a lot. Uh, yeah, it's it's enjoyable, and you have kind of a feeling that it's it's uh, a song that they have a couple could really identify with. Um, maybe, maybe more so than, than Jackson, which is actually yeah. my favorite song of theirs as a, as a duo, but. Yeah, that's, boy, it, yeah, there, these, yeah, it, it, I love that song too. That, that, there is something about If I Were a Carpenter though that just seems just very sincere. And, yeah. it, and, they, and even if they are, um, I don't know what, they're throwing themselves into it a little bit. There's just something about it that seems authentic. And so as with many things that Johnny Cash did, there's a certain kind of realness to it that's just unavoidable. And Tim Hart- And they, they were together until, until she died. And- um, Right, in 2003, I believe. And I, I, I think he, he mourned her death until he died. I yeah, think he died just, yeah, that's like- Well, so died. Yeah, they were soulmates. I think it's an interesting way of putting it, soulmates. Um, Harden, uh, the, the person who put the song together, Tim Harden was a, um, a kind of mercurial folk figure in the 1960s, early 1970s, uh, wrote many things. He was part of this folk circuit, you know, Greenwich Village folk circuit that, um, that many others came out of. Uh, he was uh, bedeviled by drugs and, um, and a fairly kind of bleak into his life. But but this is sort of Harden's um, high watermark as well. So uh, it's worth noting, it's a great song. And at 45, it's If I Were a Carpenter. One other song we want to get to today comes from a very important person, somebody who I think was uh, to some degree overlooked in her life, certainly I think to some degree is overlooked uh, even today. And um, it's, it's Cass Elliot. 
and uh, Cassie Elliott on her own with New World Coming, which is at f this week, uh, February 14th, 1970, is at 51, New World Coming. New World Coming, I, um, I heard this uh, on the radio as a, as a kid in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and in Memphis, Tennessee, everything I heard on the radio, I hated. It was all uh, country western of the, of the twangy uh, Hank Williams sort. Hmm. Well, but this Mama Cass uh, uh, song was, uh, was kind of a breath of fresh air for me. I don't think it holds up particularly well. I, I listened to it uh, yeah, I... a few days ago. Uh, it certainly, you know, it could have used the um, Phil Spector treatment, a little wall of sound. Well, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with it that. It sounds a little bit thin, you know. It's, it is a little thin. But, um, okay, there's that. Anyway, uh, this was the first release of her third solo album uh, entitled, and I kid you not, Mama's Big Ones. Yeah, this is, okay, yeah. And this is what I do want to get to. Um, it's unclear to me uh, how much she was engaged in this, but there was a lot of attention paid to Cass Elliott's physical size. And um, there's, you know, there's that title of that album, which is, I think, horrendous. I think it was horrendous even in the day. Um, the Creek Alley, right, that make, uh, when she was with the Mamas and Papas, Pos Mamas and Papas, uh, making allusion to her weight. It's just, I, I don't know. Oh. I mean, the phrase today is fat shaming. And um, there was people, you know, people, it was, it was uncomfortable. Well, and the cruelest thing you could do was stick her next to Michelle Phillips, who, who was just no, as, as skinny as they come. I, you know, I don't, um, I don't know how I have anything sophisticated to say about this, but I do think that there is something about Cassilla and her size that um, that was almost seen as a kind of, um, oh, I don't know, kind of a carnival attraction um, in that era. She was, a, she was a large woman. When, when large women were maybe less common, and certainly you did not see them on television. You did, and, and you didn't, you know, they weren't celebrities. And so, but Cass Elliott is, um, I mean, she's a pivotal figure in this era. I, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure things have changed that much in the entertainment world for fat people. I mean, you have someone like Beth Ditto oh. and, uh, Pretty much the same thing. Um, there are some some fashion shoots with her, uh, some 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 glamour uh, shots and things like that. But basically, she's still an anomaly um, in, in pop music. That's that. Yeah, that's yeah. I think that that's probably right for sure. But the 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 thing about the thing about Cass Elliot that I think is completely underplayed is the role that the role that she was in and she sort of put herself in in terms of sort of making connections and helping bring people together there was a her personality was uh, was effervescent it was warm people liked to be around her um, she lived in Laurel Canyon right for a time in Los Angeles this place in Los Angeles where where it was a kind of haven of uh, singer-songwriters, and much of the activity in Laurel Canyon happened in Cass Elliott's house or Cass Elliott's kitchen. You just, you read any account of Laurel Canyon, and it's, it's taking place at Cass Elliott's. Oh, yeah, and, and most of uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash remember their coming together as being in, in, in her kitchen. Um, so, it's, she was, yes, she was very influential and um, well-loved. Yeah, she was well loved. I mean, she was yeah, she was well loved. She's a beloved figure. I think there was great affection for for Cass Elliott in the American public as well. And um, she was making the transition um, out of uh, Mamas and Papas into into this into the solo uh, solo spotlight. She was also becoming a more kind of popular figure. She had television specials. She would you would see her or hear her uh, quite frequently. Uh, she died a very young woman in Los Angeles of a heart attack. Or, no, I'm sorry. She she died in London. Um, died in London. Died in London. Harry, she was Harry Nilsson's apartment. 
32, is that right? Uh, that, I think that's right. She was just, I mean, really young. I think she was 32. And um, as long as we're talking about this, um, one of the reasons, uh, they think the reason that she actually died was because of damage to her heart from some extreme diets that she had been trying. Um, uh, of course, the rumor was that she had choked on a, a ham sandwich. Yeah, the, 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 the cruelest rumor. Yeah, just it's uh, just another part of this vicious uh, fat shaming that you're talking about if oh, Lord. The, at all. Just an interesting sidebar. Um, a few years later, I think 1979, uh, Keith Moon died in that same bedroom in Harry yeah. Nilsson apartment uh, at 32. There we go. Kind of spooky. Anyway. I, yeah, that's, boy, that is a weird sidebar. I wonder where Harry Nilsson died. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, not to be too ghoulish, but I mean. Well, probably not there. I don't think he was even uh, in that apartment anymore. No, I think you're right. I think he died in California, but it's, um, you know, Cal, it's just, it's, you know, Cass Elliott is one of those, you know, what would have happened, you know, she was just, uh, she was on the, her way up. She was on her way to something different. And, and had she lived, you know, who knows? I mean, who knows? The last what? album was called Don't Call Me Mama Anymore. Yeah, or, she was. That was the, the title of the album. Now, just one other thing that's interesting about this, uh, this song is that it was written by uh, the songwriting team, Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde. They were yeah. a married couple. They had met uh, while working at Alden Music. Alden, because it was uh, together by Al ne Nevin and Don Kirsch Kirschner. Um, Don Kirschner. Just next to the Brill Building. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, songwriting, so Kirschner, Alden, yeah, so songwriting. So they were songwriters under contract. Um, they met, married in 1961, and are still together. Um, Which is... But Extraordinary itself. Out a ton of hits. Uh, in 1987, they were uh, inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Um, they wrote "Blame It on the Bossa Nova." On well, the Bossa Nova. Um, Edie Gourmet's only big hit. Yep. You've lost that loving feeling. Our Righteous Brothers. Yeah. We got to get out of this place. Uh, animals, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so. They Jeez. Wrote, in addition to New World Coming, uh, make your own kind of music, which uh, was yeah, which was Mama Cass's uh, hit previous to this one. Yeah, yeah, wonderful song. Yeah, wonderful um, thing. Yeah. So this song, although it doesn't hold up nearly as well as uh, a lot of their other songs, um, has uh, was written by this uh, this famous. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, we, briefly we we broached the Backrack David uh, duo a bit ago. Right. Uh, that these these songwriting duos are always sort of behind the scenes. I mean, unless you're an insider, unless you're like you're reading the the album notes and that kind of thing. But they just had an enormous role in the culture. I mean, I just oh, that's right. And, and like you said, Backrack David, um, they're so big. Uh, even I knew about them. But this is the first yeah. time I had any idea what a force uh, Barry Man and Cynthia Wilde were. Yeah, Man and Wilde are. I mean, they're they're right up there in the pantheon of great uh, of great uh, composer and composing duos in, in American life. In terms of yeah, last fifty years, they're just yeah, it's extraordinary their influence. Just even you know one of those songs would be enough to make a career. Just it's extraordinary. So there you have it. It's uh, February nineteen seventy and. So we encourage you um, to check out the playlist, which we, we post uh, alongside these, uh, these conversations. I know some of these songs are familiar, but many of them aren't. So check out the playlist. And we also then encourage you to, uh, to give us a like and also subscribe. Yeah, um, you can subscribe here. Um, our playlist is here. Um, I would encourage you to watch the playlist, uh, open a separate window, watch it parallel to this, the best way to do it. Absolutely. So we we'll see you next time. See you next time. Yeah, thanks everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now.